Welcome to the Neophytes of Narratology, the internet's most pretentious and pseudo-intellectual pursuit since, perhaps, Nietzsche's thus podcast, Zarathustra, or Camus' renowned vlog of Sisyphus. While lesser men aspire to stand on the shoulders of mere giants, we at the Lost Signals will accept nothing less than titans. So join us as we delve into the fundamentals of narrative nuance and critique the critics who proclaim to know the universal qualities of effective storytelling. Hi, and welcome back to Neophytes of Narratology. Today we are doing a, a little bit something a little bit different. We're not necessarily analyzing a uh, kind of theory on narrative. We're more applying it to a documentary we just saw, which deals with identity. I mean, in fact, we are going to be starting a little mini-series mm -hmm. on like narrative and narrators. And this one is on, in a sense, personal narrative. I'm Jonathan Ian Manser, here with Scott Thurla. Who are my new fight maniacs out there? <laughs> Christopher Morgan. Uh, sex tape. <laughs> Stephen Armosi. Hey, everybody. I got. I can't follow that. And I, we have two representations of Hulk Hogan here, and one of Gawker. As you may have gathered, uh, yes. And we are doing. Uh, we we just watched at least one third of uh, of Netflix's documentary series, uh, documentary Nobody Speak, which deals with, in part, the legalities of Hulk Hogan suing and ruining Gawker over a leaked sex tape. Mm -hmm. But we're really not interested in Hulk Hogan's sex life. We're more interested <laughs> or in... Or Gawker's sex life. Yeah, in who Hulk Hogan is. Or the representation of personalities. Versus the man that plays him. In yeah. relation... So, the first part I want to talk about is, in a sense how individuals establish their identities through fiction and their own personal narr narrative. Mm -hmm. And this kind of... Uh, Hulk Hogan really showed off an extreme version of, that. Yeah, yeah. of this sure. idea uh, in the documentary by suggesting that like, while Hulk Hogan, the character, had to be proud of the sex tape that came out had to brag had about to his sexual exploitation because yeah. that's what the character would do. Uh, the real life, uh, Hulk Hogan, Terry Bolero, I believe. Yes. Uh, is actually was very personally hurt by this, but um, when they bring it up in court, it's like, you can't judge the actions of the character versus the real person. Well, the argument it. was they're separate yeah. entities in the sense, right. therefore like rules apply to one and not the other. Mm -hmm. And all the other you know, legality of the free speech and all that around it, but nevertheless, it was one of the centerpieces of the testimony yeah. was him saying, "Listen, in one aspect, I act, I have to act this certain way, so therefore, it's not hurtful. But as an actual person who I really am, mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's impactful to me. It's. I think it's a very interesting um, idea and something that we could talk about at length." Uh, for other reasons than we're here tonight. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? But um, I think that we have to f try to remain focused sure, on... but it's a su substantive subject. The uh, narrative of that. To be yeah. sure, Steve-O. Yeah. But I would argue that every single person, maybe not to the extent of Terry... Maybe uh, not? Well, <laughs> it often fictionalizes not. their... Or, but here's the thing is, as an observer, Hulk Hogan and Terry... Scary are, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> no, are like it's an obvious like exaggeration to the point. Where it's sure, it's uh, a caricature. Yeah. Even, it's a he's a cartoon comic character. But people he even can, said that people do it. I would argue regularly and not even notice that they're doing it. Yeah, yeah or course. or they do notice it. I mean, I I worked a lot in retail and restaurants and selling cars, and literally, it's just like I got to go get in character. And it was it was exhausting. Was the best used car salesman ever. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't used. Tony Baker Donut Soldier. <laughs> no. He's the best new car salesman. Ever. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a twenty thousand dollars summer, and the rest of the year sucked. But um, <laughs> um, my whole point is, it was exhausting. But whatever 
Chris Morgan, the sales rep, uh, would do is not the person. I mean, if I did anything, that's still me. That's still an extension of me. I'm completely aware of it. Um, you know, Maybe, like, you, you could talk about like defense mechanisms people have where unconsciously, you know, they, but where they don't realize that there's, for lack of a better term, changing character. But I, I think either way, that's still you. But here's the question is, I think that a lot of people, whether you want to view it as you or not, I'm going to use an example of a sales rep. You, you go into work and put on a personality of a sales rep. You will do anything for the sales. A customer might come in saying, uh, wanting to buy something, and you know of a product better that they could have uh, for cheaper or something like that. Or like uh, the, as you're wheeling and dealing them as a car. The policy salesman. isn't as good or whatever. Yeah. It, it, or you're selling them something like a warranty that you they you know they don't need, but it's part of your job. You justify that to yourself by saying, "This is the this is the job me. This is not the real me." And I'm I think sure. that a lot of people in life you get to that whether it's in personal affairs, whether you act differently among certain groups of friends than you do with other ones, or whether you act differently amongst family members as you would like, you don't show your true face. Uh, I, I, like Billy Joel's uh, The Stranger, like you know, sure, everyone no. wears a mask. Type Agreed. Thing. I absolutely do uh, know what you're saying and agree with it. And I think like whether or not uh, people are doing it to some extent, and I think they are, almost everyone is to some degree, it's just that this is a good example of almost kind of the extreme of that because mm-hmm. as, they, as mentioned and said in the documentary itself is that he's a product almost. Like his character is a product to be sold as a... <laughs> sort of role model but you know again a larger than life persona sure that a real life person who is not yeah but that's life. a but that's a character he's honed and he's yes, worked on but that yeah. means like he's portraying as you said like that's your chris morgan salesman character just just to degree like you know fame times 10 or yeah. whatever but all i'm saying is like he it's a little bit different to me of a circumstance but i do think it's interesting it's just that they mention in his in his heyday he was marketing like you know he was his face was on so many products that it almost was elevated beyond an actual person so i think here's the here's the interesting thing and the thing that we have to focus on here because like i said this could go off into so many different sure, tangents right. my brain it's difficult right to now up. is like trying to get me off onto a tangent almost immediately like in terms of like well who should like should he not be responsible for the things that he says even if he's in character but that's not what we're here to argue about that's not what we're here to talk about I think the interesting thing that we need to talk about is how does that blurring of the character and the self affect any person or, um, as we'll talk about later, a corporation's narrative as far as like what the way that they uh, – comport themselves in public yeah, exactly yeah and like what does that what does that mean what does that say about the person and what does that say about the character and of course what does it say about society and humans in general right like i don't mean that normally i would say that as sort of a joking thing but i think it's more pertinent in this little case study sure uh, to say you go um to go off of what you're saying i think it's interesting with uh the whole kogan character versus the chris morgan sales rep character Chris can leave behind the sales rep uh, job <laughs> yeah. and find another job where he takes on a different, like, uh, wears a different hat. Where Hulk Hogan, because of his publicity, and I think this is a broader subject, we can rabbit hole ourselves and in this celebrity subject, fame, sure, yeah. is that he can't now escape that, whether typecasting or whether what his public persona he's is. He's never not Hulk Hogan he, whenever he, he's walking like, out of his door. Yeah. He can't because no one looks at him and sees Terry. Exactly. People look at him and see Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're right about that. Of course, of course, I agree. Mm-hmm. I think it's also like an interesting tie-in, even though it's technically a separate little miniseries, if you will. But look at it almost. He's a modern-day hero myth personified. Like he's a living legend in a certain sense, yes. which means every time he interacts with the public at large, he's going like he almost feels compelled or, or is going to. He has to add to that. his narrative. Yeah, exactly. He has to add to his his persona. Exactly, Steve. He has to. Uh, portray himself in a, in a way such. that's consistent with that which is an interesting thing yeah and like so we're we're tying all kind of all of this into the uh, unreliable narrator thing and like mm-hmm. where does that end like where does, where does, where does it yeah. blur you know like that that's kind of the thing that i'm interested in 
is like, where does that line blur? Where does it become like, oh, well, I'm not sure if this is Terry or Hulk Hogan. Like, well, for that, him, that... it's clearly a very uh, rare thing for that to happen if he's in public. He's constructed this persona sure. for so long, but like, if we're talking about Chris the car salesman, uh, obviously those are that's a very distinct point. Sure, the or scale like when I'm at work, different. I'm the for... one guy. When I'm when yeah. I'm out of work, I'm the other guy. And you know, everybody, like we were saying, everybody has that. But what the the I think the point that's interesting there is where do those personas kind of come together and blur into each other a little bit like you obviously have to take something from yourself to construct a, a sure. narrative a personal narrative about a character that you're going to be like where's the venn diagram you're saying like yeah. you're saying where's the like the line is are you enter your own question the line is blurred so therefore it's hard to say where it is right you're like where does the line blur it blurs always so like but that's where it becomes it's, it's not i don't i maybe other people will think this is really interesting but like i don't think it's e- interesting at either extreme Right, I think it's interesting. Like, how do you come up with a character like this? How do you come up with a narrative like this? And like, make it part, make it something that you can live with and be your entire life. You know, like, <laughs> sure. I and mean, also, right. and also, like, still kind of hold on to a part of yourself as part of that narrative. And I, I, yeah, go ahead. I Sorry. think that's, I think that's, you know, the really that gets to the heart of it. At some point, I think you lose a lot of yourself if you yeah. maintain this character for so long. It's, it's two things, uh, two like trope sort of terms. If you know them, I'll try to explain them real quickly. It's becoming the mask. It's mm-hmm. so, like you're know, creating a again a, a fictional facade that then you then have to present so often, so much of your life. Then then you believe that you're that persona versus who you actually were before that. And it's also it's like the the marketing of uh, you know the late '80s, whatever. Whenever Hulk was big in the wrestling world is it worked too well yeah so that again he could never not as we said be that persona to the public at large uh, actual good uh, similar situation uh good, good comparison is between the rock and hulk hogan so which they mm-hmm. mentioned briefly, right. but sure. they didn't do it in the way that sure. i'm about to mention it, that the rock had to fight quite hard to destroy his persona. To become Dwayne Johnson? Yes. Yep. To yep. be an yeah. actor he as Dwayne to kill Johnson? The yeah. Rock. yeah. Mm. And it's. Uh, but like, he's done uh, a very good job of that. And like, now right you can there, see a whole right. different yeah. part of his personality when he's acting or like giving um, interviews and stuff like that. I was going to say another, another really interesting uh, comparison, I guess, to this is somebody like somebody who has to go undercover. Like undercover cops or something. I was like that. actually just thinking of that. Thing. Thing. Yeah, like informants or whatever. So I want to bring this back to a couple of studies we did, or one in particular, mm-hmm. uh, which is Elizabeth Camp's idea of the autobiography, uh, a fictionalization of the self in that sense. But generally, when someone looks back upon their life and fictionalizes it, I mean, not to the sense of like a, a big fish style, not this degree. but <laughs> saying that like, but I'm. I have always decided – I was always going to be a poet. Thus, every event in my life was leading up to that um, aspect or whatever job you have. Mm. Uh, it's a reflection upon your life in hindsight where you already have a beginning, middle, and an end. Mm. What Hulk Hogan faces in a really odd sense and what a lot of like c- celebrity false fronts face is that there exists as a character in a story that is not yet written. Day to day creating that story. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, in a way, Hulk Hogan story ended for a very long time, but he was still a character without a story. Yeah, his legacy and was there, but his story was never completed. His hero's yeah. journey was still sort of in limbo. Hey guys, I hang on one second. Chris, I have to yell at you. Stop fucking around with the microphone, please. <laughs> That's right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Hulk slam you if you keep doing <laughs> it. Okay. Anyway. Um, but so yeah, I think it's like it's interesting to view. Um, it's interesting to view people who have to, in a sense, whether you look at the hero's journey. Uh-huh. All right, Hulk Hogan has been on, and he's in the return, but he has to exist on this in like plane well, of spaces. Both yeah, the it's interesting living amongst the celebrity, the fiction, the fantasy celebrity, mm-hmm. and living in a reality, and with people still uplifting him to that elevation which he no longer exists. And it's it's a tragedy in a way, um, but I, I I think this is really the first time in our civilization, or like humanity, we could that we've had this many people yeah. 
have their stories end but continue to exist as a fiction. Well, yeah, because this is the first time that celebrity can be translated this quickly, right? Mm-hmm. If you, well, yeah, like, they back in the day, if you were a celebrity, you know, hundreds of years ago, if you were a celebrity, yeah, people knew about you, but it wasn't like you had to go see them all the damn time and like present yourself to the nation all the time. Mm-hmm. Sure. Since the advent of TV and, and the advent of celebrity and, and things like that, or even radio. And internet understand. culture as well. Oh, well, that, 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 you know, radio and then TV sure, sure. and then internet have all like expanded so much faster um, than the one before. It's like, it's, it's tough to keep up and you have to kind of, decide how much of the character you're going to be and how much of yourself you want to hang on to, you know? Or, like, maybe you wanted, you decided at the outset, but perhaps, again, you get swept away in the fiction of yeah. its own entity. Like, if you're Frankenstein's monster of yourself, almost. Right. And you cannot escape it anymore. So I think an interesting... Uh, this is a good point to uh, bridge over corporations. Yep. Yeah. I, was, I was waiting to get to that. Because th- this, uh, this documentary dealt with Gawker. And... They interviewed a number of Gawker employees who, I'm not taking sides here, I'm not trying to say one is correct and one is not. They're saying that a lot of their actions were to, in a way, justify Gawker, or maybe not justify, because that's, that implies that there's wrongdoing there. But it says they're explaining, as a real person, what their, their intentions were. Their motives, yeah. What their intentions were prior to, uh, prior, uh, when versus Gawker's perception. And the fictionalized pr- presentation that people had over Gawker as being this kind of queen bitch yeah. of the internet. Right. And saying, no, 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 this is not, like, our intention was not that fiction. Here's my actual hero's journey, if you will, <laughs> over... Here's I, my actually, call. This is, uh, there's an honest... Mm. And there's, in te- there's honesty and integrity in my actions, even though it wasn't perceived that way. And th- uh, granted, I'm not j- judging whether that's correct or not, but it's, it was... The fact that a uh, fictional Hulk Hogan was suing a fictional uh, or a, narrative a, a characterized you know single right. entity was suing a characterized corporate entity, mm-hmm. in which there yeah you, the perception on both sides depending on who you sided with and like yeah I'm not going to choose sides myself here either and as well be, in, in order to prevent rabbiting for ourselves there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about free speech and all that in America mm-hmm. and in just general but at, the issue at hand is. The presentation, whether, again, a singular entity or a conglomerate, and how that then that the fiction of that is perceived again, and then pitted against each other yeah. to the public at large. And unlike Hulk Hogan, the individuals behind the fiction of Gawker were punished for their actions uh, or, or, uh, by, by the courts. Or at least yeah. legally. Were, you know, yes, the yes, one yeah. guy who uh, had... Uh, yeah, like... $230 million <laughs> dollar hold yeah. on his on his assets? Yeah. yeah. So uh, this, what's funny is that like we like the courts in this case accepted Hulk Hogan's fiction, uh, the division or between Hulk Hogan that and Terry. One, one is separate enough yeah. that to be valid in a case. And Gawker, they determined that the fiction and the individuals were one and the same. And... That's interesting. interesting the legality hell, yeah. there. That, yeah. yeah, because both both were intentional. Um, they both had a purpose for the fiction they created. They were written, so, invented narratives. Right, no, right, but what I'm saying is, if you're going to make a decision for one, it applies to the other one. Obviously not. Yeah. Or, <laughs> well, no, should. but, but, that's but they what, also made a of... point of, of saying that the uh, judge basically was bi- was coming in biased to the situation. Sure, maybe, but that sort of has no bearing on the actual like presentation no. of. A fictional facade, if you will, the best way I can describe mm-hmm. it. But that, I'm just talking about, you know, the intent. Chef. I mean, I mean, both are are a deliberate fiction. I'm yeah. just saying that it's just a matter of the scale. Like me with the car salesman <laughs> and Hulk Hogan, it's just like the intent's the same. There's a there's a motivation behind it. There's a um, sure, absolutely, you're right. You, you know, there's an agenda behind it. But still, I'm saying, you know, I'm coming along. If we're going to make a judgment on the side that, regardless you're culpable of both, so to speak, personalities. Um, I'm just saying that you can't... I'm just saying that they're both the same but different machinations. And, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're dealing, with, but, but when you're dealing right. with a think tank, as Gawker was, versus an individual, and he may have had, like, publicists and so forth helping him craft this image. I mean, that's what you have to look into if you're no, going I'm to... I'm sure he, did, he absolutely did, yeah. did have that. So, so basically, both are done by committee. Yeah. 
Right, but nobody. But like, what's that, the, that's I mean, the, how yeah. does that affect the the narrative of, of what's going on? I mean, I I, I think that you're right. Like, there, there's this really interesting, and I think all corporations do this. They have, of course, they have their spin doctors, and they, you know, try to make themselves look better than they are. Like, that's kind of. I mean, I would do that if I owned a corporation. It's the a smart kind thing of, to do. You have to present your best face to the public yeah. because that's what you do as a corporation. Actually, but that's why they have mission statements. I have a great example of both using each other in a way. So you have Mike Rowe, uh, who has cultivated a uh, a personality of like I am the hardworking, trusted, mm-hmm. sure. and you have I believe it was Ford uh, that he became a spokesman for. But it was if it's not Ford, it was another one of those yeah. kind of rugged, tough like Ford, truck Chevy, um, Chevy, maybe. Yeah. anyway. Yeah, and but. They're both cultivated the exact same, same image. image. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're totally right. <laughs> to sell the exact same I mean, identity. That's hilarious. Mm-hmm. But, but like, it, but also like, not just a joke. It's meaningful. I think it applies to what we were just saying. Yeah. As we said, almost everyone is doing it to some degree in their daily life. It's just that when you're catapulted into stardom or at least celebrity status, mm-hmm. then it becomes the spotlight on you becomes so much more intense that perhaps it becomes more difficult to keep up that facade. And it may crack. And against a, yes, a conglomerate, or would you describe it as a think tank almost, which I sort of like that. Gawker yeah. is like a think tank of tabloid journalism. <laughs> but, like, it's it's different because not, a, not one single person is technically in the spotlight there. Is the face of yeah, Gawker. exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, like, right, that's, that's I just said, Steve, they're putting their best corporate corporate Over. face forward. But a corporate face is almost faceless by, by nature. I think Hulk Hogan almost... almost was looked better upon because he didn't crack, you know, like he held up the facade of Hulk Hogan all the way up until the trial. In w- at yeah, which, but at which that's point him he was like, cracking though. At which point, well, I don't know if it's I him see, cracking. It's I him wanting it, to get money, you know. It, no, not if you're, quite. If you're looking at it negatively, they even brought up that point. Of course. But I don't want to like delve into that either. Mm-hmm. I do see what you're saying. Uh, sorry, go on though. But it's kind of it's kind of the idea of like he played this character so well, and. Yeah, he refused to the break. Mask. Refused to break characters so much that he went out and bragged about the sex tape that that he had. And and, and sure, in one character. of the arguments that was made was like behind closed doors, and you know, none of us are actually going to know if this is true. I don't know if it's true. I, I I don't doubt it that you know when he was behind closed doors, he was hurt by a sex tape being leaked of him as like as his marriage fell apart and all this like other stuff. Like that's sure, and that's brutal. Like- but it's great for your narrative if you're that character of Hulk Hogan, you know? Sure. It's, that's, is, that's like the train catch-22 as, like, a person. Exactly. It's like the, the meeting, like, the unstoppable force, immovable object. Yeah. Like, you are you have to be both, and you have to sort of be both at the same time. Right. And two, two sides of the same coin. So it is very interesting to delve into, like, to think about the identity crisis, if you will, <laughs> of all of this. And it's this case specifically, which we're using sort of a springboard to go on. But, yeah, I mean, it's super interesting, and like we said... We only watched like about the first forty minutes or so, mm-hmm. but that's the sort of that set up like the thing we're delving into. And yes, there's a lot of issues at hand. Yeah, but, I, uh, I, I would like said, to point out that we only watched the first forty minutes because it started to veer off into other topics that were certainly seemingly other interesting, interesting issues, yes. and, but and probably not quite as applicable to this discussion. Right now, sure. And you also see that after forty minutes, we we have to keep focus because there's so many issues related yeah. to this that came out of this. And I'm not even talking about the fact that it was encased in. Another thing, and and what we're talking about, it happens to be a byproduct of the agenda of the of the documentary. I'm just saying, just in this subject, 40 minutes was a lot to absorb and think about. Yeah, sure, and it was really really well done. Like I said, for what we watched of it, but yeah, like I said, we're using this as a neat spring, neat little, uh, helpful little springboard that ties in to our little narrator. uh, Arc, yes, go ahead. No, I was gonna. I'm sorry. I, I was like thinking we're talking about narrative, but I'm like. In my mind, I have to keep pulling away from the culpability of the narrative. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, it's just like I, I, I keep I keep having to think about, okay, we're just focusing on the narrative because there's so many things to this. See, so uh, I'm going to bring up why the culpability of the narrative isn't necessarily important to this conversation. It's important if you view it as, as, narr- as the falsification of itself as an isolated instance of modern day. It's not. And whether... A person is culpable Maybe. for the fictional identity is really, uh, again, if morality is subjective, which I believe it is, it's when it is. It's sort of Alexander ancillary. the Great had um, scribes with him to tell his tale of the, sure. and that's why he has uh, the, the legacy that he has, yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. Versus, like, and the thing is, people have fictionalized themselves 
throughout history. Oh, or, or been fictionalized. Plato, uh, fictionalized Aristotle. Socrates. Yeah. Uh, and used him as a kind of a false mask of a person before. We do, like, whether it's the small moments, like a person at a job, whether it's unexpected or uh, cultivated celebrity, mm -hmm. or whether it's corporations adopt or governments or the press, any collective like, entities uh, or whatever, yeah, putting on an idea of mm -hmm. this is how we the image we want portrayed to the people versus what actually exists. And, and tying that in into something you said before was uh, versus the individual versus a corporation. Okay, you look at you look at uh, Terry with whatever his name is, with the uh, handlebar mustache, the way it comes, that's kind of like not quite a goatee. Anything called Kogan, no matter what he is. But to me, when I looked at Gawker, Gawker didn't come into focus until I saw like their little, the way they presented their like slogan, the way they wrote Gawker. And then I started thinking about, okay, that's like why companies think about what image they choose, because it's not like you're seeing the individuals, you're seeing that logo, you're seeing those colors. Or you, if you, they do, they have a the Geico Gecko. Yep. You have um, mm -hmm. Ronald Gecko. McDonald. You have the Ronald Lost McDonald. Signals uh, Tower. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Whatever. What happened? Going to bring up, <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. We're on the we're on those, those corporations <laughs> level, obviously. <laughs> even sure. if I mean, you're right about well, all that. Even if it's a celebrity, a real right. celebrity, it's generally a fictionalized uh, instance, presentation. So, yeah. yeah. Of yeah. course. Yeah, but it's. Uh, I think you, you were saying before is the perception of the individual versus the symbol for the you're collective. Right. It's still yeah. represented by an image of some sort, whether it's a person, i.e. Hulk Hogan, or a corporation, i.e. Gawker, with whatever re is representative of them as a whole. Yeah. So now that we've solved uh, <laughs> the question of consciousness, cognition, uh, my identity, identity crisis is over. <laughs> <Yeah>. I guess. <laughs> uh, Anyway, I'm Jonathan Ian Manzer here at Scott And I can feel my human mask slipping. See you next time. Christopher Morgan. Good night. And Stephen Ramos. Have a good night. This has been the Neophytes of Narratology. We hope that you've experienced an epiphany or two of the literary nature, but only metaphorically, of course. Editing and engineering by Jonathan Ian Manzer. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates.